He was famous to me, but he was famous as a dickhead. Was he treating you nicely? No, he was a heinous dickhead. Well, and the last straw was when he took a pan of risotto that I had deigned to be perfect and he had deigned to be less than perfect. He grabbed it, he picked it up, and he threw it at me like that. The whole thing, whoosh, whoosh, on me. And you burned, of course. And then I took two big handfuls of salt and went over to the mother sauce, and I stirred it in, and I walked out. No way. Food, you're going to burn. I'm not going to burn. We're standing right here. There's two of us right. making one dish. Fame. How many yeah. times do you go to the White House? I've been there four or five times. Fortune. Even at a top dollar, you make much more money in a trattoria than you do in a fancy restaurant. My guest, Mario Battaglia. The man, the brand, and of course, the chef. It's all on the table. I love parking in New York City. Well, we both live in New York. New York is a big city. Mario is a downtown guy. I am a midtown guy. We live in the same world, but we don't, we don't necessarily bump into each other. Ah, the king great. of chefs. The chef of kings. What's up, buddy? What did you bring over? I brought some groceries. I was told we were making lunch together. So I went to my favorite store. Which one is it? Tell um, me. I can't say the name on TV. <laughs> yeah, I have been many times. I didn't see Italy coming. It came out of nowhere. Now he has one in Rome, three times the size of Italy in New York. Look in, what in I have. Italy, by the way, to welcome you. I think it's one of your uh, favorite cocktails. This is an Aperol Spritz. You know how to yes. make them? I made it. I don't know if I know how to make it. Let's see if you, you do. do. How is it? It's perfect. Is it really? Cool. Not surprising. So, what did you bring? I brought calamari. Yeah. Okay, I brought uh, Israeli couscous. Israeli couscous was a surprise. So Israeli couscous is considered what, like a pasta? Yeah, for me it's a pasta. For you it's a pasta. Almost never would I ever serve pasta with the protein in a main course. You can always tell when someone's kind of a piker when they're serving chicken with tortellini on the side. The pasta is its own dish. And even yes. if there's spaghetti and meatballs, they would have the spaghetti with the sauce and the meatballs first. Yeah. And then they would serve the meatballs as a main and course. And if it's about the bolognese. Well, the bolognese has meat in it. There's, okay. It's okay to have meat, but not chunks of protein. The dish that we're making is called Two Minute Calamari, Sicilian lifeguard style. By the time the calamari gets into the game, yeah. it'll only take two minutes. Okay. Now, I never met a Sicilian lifeguard, but this is how I imagine he or ah, she okay. might make it. And because when you think about the greatness of Italian cooking, it's really micro-regional, like all of the great French cooking. Yeah. So Sicily is actually closer to Tunisia than it is to Milan. So the food and flavors uh, are more yeah. northern African than yeah. they are, per se, recognizably there. Italian. Well, there's really currants, there's pine nuts, there's yeah. scallions, there's a little heat. I, I brought our world-famous babo um, jalapeno pesto. Jalapeno which you can pesto? Taste it, smell it. I want to taste. Is it very spicy? Or? No, no. Clean. Oh, it's nice. A little punch. Oh, I like it. How do you know so much about Italy? I went to high school in Spain, then I went to college in New Jersey, then I worked for the Four Seasons Company yeah. on, on the West Coast, and I realized I wanted to go back to Italy, so I moved to a little town between Bologna and Florence, and I worked in this trattoria about as big as this kitchen. Let's start cooking. Okay. Okay, we're going to make a dish called Two Minute Calamari Sicilian Lifeguard Style. Two Minute Calamari. And in the restaurant, it takes two minutes because we have all of our mise en place ready. Yes. So the first thing we're going to make is basic tomato sauce. So if you can cut up half that onion into quarter inch dice. So when you were in Spain, you live in Madrid, right? Yep. You travel the country? All the time. All the time on a weekend with your parents. Exactly. And that gives you a knowledge of Spanish culture. And right, and we got to travel. I mean, I was from the West Coast, outside of Seattle. And, uh, you know, the furthest we'd been were the Oregon Dunes to see the sea lions. Yeah. And Vancouver to see the Canadians. I think I like the sea lions better, but I do like Canadians. <laughs> Eric's great. I've always loved him. He's a, kind of a Zen master ninja dude. And having a conversation with someone that's that vetted and that very much confident about what they do is always a blast. I put it here? Right in there. You're going to burn. I'm not going to burn. We're standing right here. There's two of us Hi. making one dish. If there's a fire today, we're both fired. Well, he has the habit of being on television, being the darling of the media. Whatever he does, it's a strong statement about what he thinks or about himself, the way he wants to be portrayed. I certainly shoot the gun often more quickly than I should, but my heart and my imagination are very much intertwined. Explain to me a little bit your knowledge about the Italian culture. Well, I grew up as an Italian-American. Oh, my mom was French-Canadian and English, and my dad was Italian. My grandpa, Lyon Laframboise, that's, that's his real that's name. That's fucking French. Really That's French. on my mom's side. Okay. He was a French-Canadian. He was a hop farmer. 
Yes. And then on my dad's side, Leonetta Merlino became Leonetta Batali with Armando Batali. And so we always had food. And whether it was Italian or Californian or Washington State or French, it didn't really matter to us. We just ate well. And it wasn't like we ate well because we were reading some fancy magazine. We ate well because that's just what we did. Do you want to start cleaning the calamari? Uh, leave the tentacles whole. OK. Take the tubes into. Something like that? OK. Yeah. So now my onions are going here. I've got a little salt in them. I'm going to add about a teaspoon of fresh thyme. So that's the way you make the tomato sauce? Yeah, you squeeze them, because you still want little pieces. When did you end up in a kitchen? Did you go to a school? Uh, after I graduated college, I went to the Cordon Bleu. So you go to Cordon Bleu, and you learn how to make sole d'oeuvre. You spend the whole day making a dish that no one has made since 1953, right? It's a great dish. You're going to eventually have to make 250 portions. Yes, and then you think you are a chef. Right. So you're in London, obviously you speak English, so it's easy for you. Mm -hmm. Are you with the family there or you? My parents lived there at that time and I lived around the corner from them though. My dad worked for Boeing and after they lived in Madrid, they lived in London for like seven years and then they moved back to Seattle. So you're in London and then from the culinary school, where did you go? I worked for Michael Pierre White. When he was famous? Before or... Harvey's, no, he wasn't famous. I mean, he was famous to me, but he was famous uh, as a so dickhead. He was like young and energetic. And angry. Right. Every day I'd go in there Every day we'd walk in the kitchen, and then he'd say, all right, here's your challenge today. And there's a 50-pound bag of potatoes, and he goes like this, and he picks it up, and he throws it over his shoulder, because he was strong. Yeah, the guy is like six yeah. foot four. Or so six I tried four. that every day for like the entire time I worked there, and I could never really make it happen. I'd crumble down like this, go underneath the potatoes, much to his happiness. Was he treating you nicely? Or you... No, he was a heinous dickhead. Well, and the last straw was when he took a pan of risotto that I had deigned to be perfect, and he had deigned to be less than perfect. He grabbed it, he picked it up, and he threw it at me like that. The whole thing, whoosh, on me. And you burned, of course. Uh, it was more of a, an emotional burn than a physical burn, because I had a chef coat on. You opened but the jacket. I opened the jacket, I threw it off, I went in the back. I may have shed a tear. Oh, that was and then I took two big handfuls of salt and went over to the mother sauce, and I stirred it in, and I walked out. No way. Yep. You did that? I did that. Obviously, he's articulate. We all know that. Uh, he speaks English much better than I do. His answers are already uh, much better. When French fancy chefs retire, they move to a beach town in Italy. Because what they really long for are dishes that aren't about technique. They're all about product. So we drink on the shore. Well, Hold on. Take it easy. Take it easy, baby. Yeah. Say you can line. do you have no it. Idea. Don't have no worry. Idea. <laughs> With the heat, it goes straight to my head. We have to move into our white wine, too. Oh, fuck. That so was a joke. <laughs> there you go. Cheers. Cheers. Do you ever wonder what it would be like to quit your job and live a life you've always dreamed of? A bad day in the island still beats a good day in the office. Join me, Savannah Jane Buffett, as I head to St. Croix to meet Nate Olive, an expat from Atlanta who moved down here to follow his passion of running a sustainable farm in paradise, and in the meantime, met the woman of his dreams. What really made me a Virgin Islander was when I married Shelly. You're really living the expat dream. Paradise, I believe, is like what you make of it. My advice to expats, don't live on a place, live in a place. This is it, man. This is the life. Yeah!